Hello, and welcome to episode 77 of PauseCast. It is March 22nd, 2018. I am Jessica Alouette, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm Matt Kenner, I use he, him. Welcome. Hey! hey. Another, uh, another week. Another week. An- another dollar? You're making a dollar a week. Um, That's tough. That's real rough. You get- it's really rough. Um, I think you might be getting a bad deal. Yeah. You might want to back out of that, I think. You can. Just, you know, take it, take it easier than getting a dollar a week. And this is like a really big dollar coin made of solid gold. Then Yo, okay. if that dollar coin is made of real solid gold, you keep that and you <laughs> sell that later for, what, thousands of dollars? Yeah, if that's the dollar you're making every week. If that's, yeah, if that's, a do- if that's the only dollar you can make in a week, make it an absurdly large one. That's that's reasonable advice. Yeah, that's also definitely the topic of our podcast. Not, definitely, not, not video absolutely. Games. Well, I mean, you could get absurdly large giant coins in video games. Let's talk lots about of, uh, lots those, of games have gold Let's coins. talk about the big ones you can get in Donkey Kong Country. The banana coins. They're like three quarters of the size of a gorilla. <laughs> what about <laughs> Minecraft, where you can carry around um, one meter cubed blocks of gold, like stacks of 64 of them all in your person? I'm, oh, that's th- true. I'm sure that someone's done the calculations, and I'm pretty sure you would be a black hole. <laughs> I can't believe that Steve, the Minecraft protagonist, is made of antimatter. <laughs> I can I can believe that. Why can't you believe that? It's the most realistic part of that game. Oh yeah, that's true. Definitely that Steve from Minecraft is made of antimatter. That's um That's not fanon, by the way. We've we've not made that up. That's that's real and true. A hundred percent guaranteed. The pause cast guarantee. I think that's <laughs> that's the name of the episode. I think I found it. The pause cast guarantee. Uh, welcome to our show about video games and how absurd they are sometimes, and how good they are sometimes as well. And uh, sometimes gonna both. kick us off. Ooh, yeah, sometimes both. I'm uh, gonna kick us off with a question for Mark. What have you been playing this week? Um, not that much. I've been pretty busy this week, but I I played a little bit more Diablo three, and it's been absurd and fun. Um. And I also tried out a new game that I hadn't played before on the weekend, where I, I was having sort of one of those moods where I w- knew I wanted to play a video game, but I didn't know which video game. So I was looking through my Steam library, and nothing was jumping out at me, and I thought, oh, I'll check my Humble library, because sometimes there's stuff in there I've forgotten about. And there was something in there I'd forgotten about that had been on my radar for a while. I think it was even on my wish list for a while. And apparently, I own it, and I just didn't realize... So I essentially got to play it for free, it feels like. Um, That game is Shadow Tactics Blades of the Shogun, which is kind of a a real-time tactics game. Um, So most tactics games, like XCOM and stuff, are turn-based, and I'm really used to that. Um, Yeah, and you've been playing a lot of Into the Breach recently, which is another one of those. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Turn-based tactics games are a favorite of mine. I come back to them again and again. Games like Final Fantasy Tactics Advance and um, Ogre Battle, Light of Lotus and stuff, they're they're, um, all turn-based tactics games, and I've I've really liked them for a long time. I'd, I'd forgotten it had been a while since I looked at this game. I just remembered, oh, I remember this was a tactics game I was looking forward to. Um, so it surprised me a little bit to realize, oh, this is a real time tactics game. So you actually have to think about timing now. You don't just have unlimited time pressure to make a decision. Although, um, it is, it does still seem to be set up in such a way where you can just put your characters in a position where they're hidden and they're pretty much safe sitting there for a while, unless you know someone is actively looking for you. And Mm. it's, it's quite stealth based as well. Um... Or maybe that's just the way I've been playing it, but it feels different like that's the way I've been encouraged to play it, by the tutorials and the level design. You've got a bunch and of... I would, I would imagine by the, by the name as well. Shadow Tactics I mean, the seems first, to indicate yeah. a level of stealth. The first character that you get to use is definitely all about stealth as well. Like They've got a tool that lets them climb onto rooftops and they can kill enemies at distance and stuff. Um, okay. 
stealth's definitely a big aspect. It's got ways of like looking at the enemy's cones of vision. So you know you wait till they're looking the other way and then you dash across. Um, but yeah, so there's unlike games like XCOM or the other ones I mentioned, you would get a lot of sort of generated characters who are kind of fodderish, and then a few named characters um, who are related to the story. There are only a few main characters that are related to the story. Um, mm-hmm. I've, I've only played the first three missions and I've not finished the third one. So I don't know if any of this changes later in the game, by the way. I, I know there's still one main character I've yet to be introduced to. Um, but the missions, you don't like... I put my characters here and here when I start. It's it's much more narrative-based. And it's, it's really neat. I've enjoyed it. There's like good interaction between the characters as well. Um, they've all got their unique movesets and just abilities so you know like oh in order to do this this character needs to do this and this one can cover them in this way um it's quite neat it's um it's it's real weird playing it real time i'm i've had a hard time getting my head around that there have been a few times in the third mission where i've you've got two characters there and they're often quite separated and i've sort of left one alone for a while only for eventually to hear oh they've been discovered and they're in a fight and that's bad um at which point I, i've been doing the thing of if you get seen load the game um mm. and th- th- the idea of saving and loading seems to be encouraged by the game there's actually a timer that shows from your last quick save so it kind of encourages you and prompts you to save often and then you have the option to quick load any of your last three quick saves so it seems like it's quite a common it, it it's trying to encourage you to um save off and try something and go back if you fail which is quite interesting in the end mission screen it'll tell you like you saved this many times and you loaded this many times um which i don't think i've seen in many games there are most of them just forget everything that happened when you load a game but this one this one keeps track of that yeah uh, does it have some sort of like mission ranking system there are certain objectives you do to get like badges in the missions I think I remember seeing that one of them was like, hey, do this without saving and stuff. Um, So they don't give you like an A or a B rank at the end, but there are like challenges to do during the mission. And if I remember right, there's some some stuff that encourages speedrunning, I think. But since I'm really not trying to rush through these, I didn't pay much attention to that. So I can't remember the specifics off the top of my head. But um, yeah, I've been enjoying it so far. I I got stuck in the third mission, unfortunately. I think I kind of, I got both the characters into quite far apart positions where they're both quite entrenched, like, you know, behind enemy lines kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's hard to get either of them out. And I might need to backtrack a bit and try a different approach. Because everything I tried for a while um was causing a lot of problems like they'd get seen get in a fight possibly die i'd load um so it's it can be quite hard or maybe i'm just i'm bad at it <laughs> but um <laughs> it's a good challenge it's it's quite fun i've en- i've definitely enjoyed it so far and i want to try it again but um it's just a busy week so i've only got to try it i think i played one session of it on sunday um out of curiosity yeah you said you were having a hard time adjusting the like real-time tactics and stuff i wonder if you could make the argument that a game like dishonored is a real-time tactics thing and maybe approach it more in that sort of light maybe it it, it kind of is i i feel when i talk about a tactics game there are two elements that i consider and they might not really be important but i they're integral just in my view of a tactics game one of sure. them is you're controlling multiple characters. Um, and the other is the perspective where there's some sort of top-down or isometric perspective where you can see a large amount of the battlefield and, and uh, multiple characters. So I don't think either of those apply to Dishonored, but you might be solving the same sort of problems using similar methods. So like, I, I definitely won't deny that there are similarities there. Yeah. Cool. I've, I'm glad that you have picked this up because it's been on my radar a little bit. I honestly also didn't know it was a real-time tactics game. I, mm. I, I thought it was turn-based as well. Because it's such so, a common thing for tactics games to be turn-based. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you, like, honestly, I think tactics games, and I do think that turn-based kind of approach. I think, like, Final Fantasy tactics 
is hmm. the first like game that kind of explicitly comes to mind there. I've never actually played Final Fantasy Tactics itself. I've played the Game Boy Advance game, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. But I haven't oh, played right, Final yeah. Fantasy Tactics. I know it exists. I've actually but... only played I've only played Final Fantasy Tactics Advance as well, okay. so Yeah, it's a huge mouthful to say though, so that's the other thing. Yeah. Same same footing here. Yeah. Um Yeah, cool. I'm yeah. I'm glad that you've picked that up. I that's... can't remember where I picked it up though. It must have been in a humble of... bundle at some point. I think it was in a monthly. Um I think it was in the monthly that you got the Elder Scrolls online in. Ah, okay. Right. Does that mean that you would own it then? Yes, it does. Well, there you go. You can you can hopefully try it out. Exactly. I don't think there's any multiplayer component to it, though. I'd, I'd, I'd be surprised if there was. I haven't seen anything. Yeah. Also, upon reflection, I think Hitman is maybe more of the, like... Oh, yeah. I, I guess can... real-time tactics example I, I was thinking really of. Because that. everything resets itself to the same positions, and you do have to think very tactically in your approach. Hmm. Uh, where Dishonored, I think there is an element of randomness to it. Well, I mean, tactics games can have randomness to them as well. Like, XCOM's missions were generated from parts of maps yeah, that got yeah. strung together. That's true. And I mean, if you wanted to, if you went into, like, Dishonored and such, you could also make the argument for Deus Ex and all this genre being a type of real-time tactics game. I think... Uh, what I, what it comes back to to me is an important part of the tactics genre is having multiple characters you're controlling. I mean, I right, say that, yeah. and now I'm thinking actually, when I was playing Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, I'd often like just send in one character into a mission just to see how how well I could do with one character. I I had a point where I was um I was playing Fire Emblem mm-hmm. quite a bit, and in Fire Emblem Awakening, there's a specific character that you can get. That can become extremely powerful, oh, extremely yes. fast. Yes, um, you know who I'm talking about. I do, I do. Um, Donald, my beautiful boy. Um, <laughs> he can become very powerful very fast. And at one point in one of my playthroughs, I was sending Donald out alone against full squads, and he would just wipe the floor. <laughs> Yeah. Like, it, it was kind of incredible to witness, and then one time I got, you know, too confident... And Donald died in that safe. Oh no! Yeah, so uh, I left that one alone for a little bit. I think. Yeah. Final Fantasy Tactics Advance had this thing where you would just randomly get characters offering to join your clan. You're like the pool of characters you can pull, you can choose from. Um, yeah. And they would always be at the average level of everyone in there, and then the enemies you fought would also match the average level. But what happened was. You had all these low-level characters join, and you'd never use them. So they'd stay low-level, and they'd hold that average down. So you ended up with Ooh. kind of a, a level curve where the characters you used were typically a much higher level than the level of the enemies you were fighting. So it was very yeah, easy and then to, if you had to power pull, level a few. If you had to pull any reserves, then yeah, you could power level there. And you could also like find yourself in a dangerous situation if you lose... like one or two of your mains and have to start well, pulling from your reserves. But that doesn't really happen because in if, if you remember in that game, most of the time there are only a few specific locations and missions where characters can actually die. Mm. Um, otherwise, they're just unconscious and they'll come back at the end of the fight. And you tend to be really, really, really careful in the places where they can die. <laughs> um, I, I don't think I ever had trouble with losing a character in that game because as a, you have to remember as well all your characters tend to be over leveled for the enemies which I mean I, right, I still yeah. enjoyed it a lot despite that it was fun as well to have this one character who was like super fast so they'd still be taking a lot of turns even though there's like they're outnumbered six to one they could turn invisible because you made sure they got that skill and then just like go up and stab people and they'd die and then go disapp- disappear and around again it's it was fun doing that as well as putting out a whole um group of people and playing it i suppose properly okay but no i do like Uh, tactics games did you ever play the disgaea series no is that tactics as well that is a tactics i should look into Um, it because i've seen the name for sure but i've never played it yeah um from what i know it's like tactics comedy like it doesn't. It's not a game that takes itself very seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, like there is a, a there's a character 
in the disguise series who is quite literally uh named mid boss by one of the other characters are they a boss in the middle of the game yes they are they are just a mid boss they're like a middle of the level boss and but like there is a goof about how you know the main character is talking to this character and he's like you're so insignificant i'm going to call you mid boss <laughs> What platforms and, is it on? I should see if I can... Uh, it is available on PSP, and it is available on PC now as well. PSP? I, I haven't dusted it's... off my PSP in a while. I I don't know if it's available for any modern um, consoles. Okay. I think maybe Disgaea 5 is coming to the Switch, but I think that's the most modern... Right, and uh, I don't have a Switch. That. Yeah, no. I... I keep looking at his Switch, dude, and it keeps getting tempting. <laughs> It'd be a lot more tempting if it were a lot less expensive. Yeah, I mean, the other the other side of that for me is I keep looking at the Switch, and I keep looking at my Wii U, um, and I keep looking at the collection of games that was on the Wii U being released in better forms on the Switch, <laughs> and thinking about, hmm... I'm running out of Wii U exclusives here. Because <laughs> half the reason I bought it was, um, surprise, surprise, it was Bayonetta. I bought mm. the Wii U to play Bayonetta 2. It's your Monster Hunter, a... right? <laughs> it's my Monster Hunter, yeah. Um, I I did that to play Bayonetta 2, and I got a few of the other exclusives for it. Like, mm. I got um, like a Breath of the Wild, because that came out on Wii U as well. I got... Um, Tokyo Mirage Sessions, which is like a Persona slash Fire Emblem crossover, which is oh, kind of weird. Interesting. Um, I got Splatoon when that was out, and now like a lot of the games that the Wii U had that I cared about are just on the Switch or on the Switch to begin with. Mm. And Splatoon Two has a lot of the original Splatoon maps, but with a whole bunch of new stuff. Mario Kart 8 has all of the, like, collected DLC and stuff in one package. Uh, there's a Smash Bros. game coming out on Switch. Um, there's Xenoblade Chronicles on the Switch. Like, all of these things that I bought a Wii U for are now just sitting on the Switch, and I'm looking at my Wii U, and I'm looking at the Switch, and thinking, boy, I sure would love to play Super Mario Odyssey and the better versions of all of these games on a portable console. Yeah, it's annoying that you wouldn't just be able to use the same copies of the games that you've got and just play them on the different console. Well, I mean, like, formats change, yeah, yeah. architectures change, all this jazz. It is annoying, but, like, I get it, because yeah. the Wii U was an underpowered console to begin with, um, and now we have a more powerful console that's also fully portable, and that's... Uh, looking more and more tempting to me as I look at the possibility of uh, long bus rides again coming soon. Right. Yeah, having something like a Switch on the bus would be nice. Yeah, especially for um, Super Mario Odyssey. That's, that's what's got my attention on the Switch that's right That's like now. the RPG one, right? Uh, no, it is just no? a, a normal Mario game. Oh, okay. I, sorry, but you like, know I don't pay much attention to the to them. So. Yeah, it's a normal Mario game with a more open world format than previous okay. Mario games have had. Okay. So that's got my attention. Mm -hmm. Um. Speaking. Should of I tell you about which, the yeah. things that have uh, had my attention this, this week? This week, yeah, I was just going to ask that. What have you been playing? Uh, I have played. Uh, first and foremost, kind of my usuals. Um. I've been playing Player Unknowns. I've been playing Overwatch a lot. Um, might be playing on a team very soon, which I'm very excited about. Um, been playing Fortnite Battle Royale, um, a game which I was not originally very certain about, and the more I play it, the more I think I like it, even it's in gotten... spite of like, inferior gun mechanics to PUBG. It's gotten really popular, right? Yeah, it's gotten really, really, really popular. Um, I think we talked about last week, there was, like, 
Twitch record smashing happen, happening because of Fortnite and celebrities playing Fortnite. And oh, is that what they were doing? Earlier, yeah. Uh, there was a couple of celebrities who were playing with a popular, an already popular streamer, which that happened again today when the actor who plays Carl in The Walking Dead, I don't know his name offhand, so excuse me, uh, pl- was uh, playing PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds with another very popular streamer. Um, so, like, so, so, it's some crazy stuff is happening on Twitch in the Battle Royale space. Um, that's been good. Um, besides that, I dove back into a game that I hadn't played in bloody years. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, have you ever heard of Kingdoms of Amalur? The Reckoning? Yes. I've got that, actually. I haven't played that much of it, but I, but I own it. That game, it's really interesting. Yeah? Uh, it's maybe, like, I think it's really bad at storytelling. I want to be straight up about that. Yeah, I, I, um, I found myself, unfortunately, losing interest quite fast. And honestly, part of that was the fact that I got in the version that had, like, you get some DLC, powerful items, right at the start, and then suddenly there's no reason to get excited about any other items that show up in the early game. Right, yeah, I've got that too, I'm just ignoring it. Yeah, that's what I should just, have done. I've left it in the chest, and I'm pretending it doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, um, it also is just tremendously bad about, like, doing the, the like, generic fantasy lore dump. <laughs> uh, where it dumps, like, a whole bunch of characters and stuff, like, pretty well constantly at you. Mm. Um, like, it's it's bad. Um, it's really bad for that. But? But. There's other mechanics in that game that are really interesting, including its, like, cross-classing stuff that it's got going on. So remind me how it works. It's been quite a while since I've touched that game. Okay. Kingdoms of Amalur sets you up as a character called a Fate Weaver. Uh, Basically, your character, while everybody else around you is bound by the threads of fate your character has become unbound from the threads of fate in some way shape or form and can influence their own destiny uh at each and every point theirs is completely unwritten where most people in the world is totally written this ties into its cross-classing system um what you can do is depending on how many points you have put into one of three trees Different destinies, quote-unquote, unlock that, uh, unlock certain focused abilities and buffs. Um, So you can get, for example, if you have two points in every tree, there's a class that gives you 7% buffs to attack damage and defense, I think. Right. Where if you have three points in magic, you may be able to choose a destiny that... Um, focuses on giving you a higher mana pool if you're using magic a lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, as you continue to increase the amount of skills that you have in each tree, uh, at certain thresholds, more tiers of that tree unlock. Um, like story thresholds? And... Or... Pardon? Was that story thresholds that they unlock or level thresholds? No, or... like um, point thresholds. Oh, right, from the so points you So remember I've talked yeah. about yeah, uh, I was about to compare it to Grim Dawn, except without the, like, you have to spend points to unlock further tiers. Uh, right, on, yeah. On the tier itself, you just spend spend points and it contributes to that tier. Mm-hmm. Um, there are systems that will later allow you to get buffs for both, like, say, your strength and your mana pool, because you are cross-classing between a warrior and a mage. It's kind of a neat setup and system, um, but it's really bad about the like fantasy lore dumps and like, oh, this place has been abandoned for hundreds of years, and there were great battles here, and here is all of the great battles and all of the heroes, and it's like, I'm going to remember zero of this. Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah. It's kind of like, it's throwaway information. It, it can be nice it, for I, games to have that there, 
like for people yeah. who want to follow it up. Um, yeah, for sure. But you want to make it feel like an established world and not an encyclopedia where you get to, you have to read it cover to cover. Yeah, and it feels more encyclopedic than I think I'd like it to. Mm-hmm. But that also means that I can sort of play it like like a Diablo kind of deal where I don't necessarily care about the story and I just <laughs> want to have it be like an idle game. Yeah. Like, I, I, don't, I don't care about the story of Diablo. No, um, no. I'm I mean, sure I, I, cool I went through it once the first time more. and then realized, oh, wait, you don't have to care about this. Yeah. They kind of now even seem to discourage caring about the story because you can just jump straight into the adventure mode where there isn't a story. Yeah, exactly. There's like Zoltan Kuhl's ghost and you yeah. have to interact with him to get Kanai's cube and that's kind of all that there is. And like other characters are there and they talk and that's it. Like yeah. they just talk they to each just, other in the background. They kind of talk at you a lot of the time. Yeah. But it's or just like, hey, like other character, do you have a crush on other yeah. other character? Yeah. Or like, hey, other character, you used to do this thing. Why yeah. did you do this other thing? And then the other character will answer. Yeah. Like it, it just it is fleshing out the world. It is idle conversation and like. That that stuff I think feels a lot more natural than what Kingdoms of Amalur has ended yeah. up doing. It, the, the first that's... fifty or so times you hear the same conversation, <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's hard to not do. Yeah, that said though, I I really do like the approach that Kingdoms of Amalur has to just its setup. Mm-hmm. Um, it's fun to play. It is kind of like a single player MMO. How um, do you mean that? I believe... I, it it feels mechanically similar to things like World of Warcraft, but it's entirely single player and offline. But like, what what aspects are mechanically similar? I'm thinking combat primarily. Okay. You have like active skills and stuff that you're using. Um, on a cooldown. Combat kind of yeah, it's on cooldowns and combat's kind of slow. Like melee combat, bad is kind of slow-ish. There's no like fine aiming for your ranged weapons. Like, it's right. very, very stripped down. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's a bad thing, necessarily, though. I think it works, and Kingdoms of Amalur does make it work. I'm kind of keen to play more of it, even if I don't care about the story. It's just kind of <laughs> nice to wander around in. It's pretty. It the, Visually, it holds up, because it doesn't go for realism. It goes for, again, that World of Warcraft, very cartoony style. Actually, speaking of pretty, you just reminded me of something I saw you were saying on Twitter earlier today about um, water in video games. Yes! Let's talk about water in video games. Yeah, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Sea of Thieves has the most detailed ocean sim I've ever seen in a video game. Holy shit. It looks amazing. I saw like a brief video today and it was like stormy seas with a bit of light shining through the high waves. and uh, Yeah, like it looked really good. There's that aspect of it too, but there's also just like the above ocean aspect and like you can see like dimples in the waves and stuff like that. Like you can see a lot of detail on the water itself. Uh, You can see like bits of water flying off as a wave crests. Um, Like it's it's just fantastically detailed. Um, I remember being really impressed in Assassin's Creed 3 with its water simulation, and that was a few years ago now. I imagine they proved yeah. a lot on it in Black Flag, but I never played that. Oh, it's substantially improved in Black Flag. I'll have to show you next time you're over, but like, mm. it is full, like, full-on waves, um, full-on like storms as well. Um, it all affects your heading as you're steering. There's tidal wave systems. Um, it, they really stepped up that ocean simulation for Assassin's Creed 4. And prior to Sea of Thieves, I think it was the most detailed ocean sim that was in a video game that I've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, Sea of Thieves may have just overtaken that. So have you been Zaf playing Avish, Sea of Thieves? Uh, I have not been. I've just been watching um, some of the Polygon video team have been playing it. Right. So I've been watching their streams. Uh, Zaf Apogee in the chat says that Black Flag stands up impressively well for its age in all regards. Uh, I I would maybe only disagree on one aspect of that, and I think it's that 
Assassin's Creed 4 story is not particularly good or <laughs> stand up. Like, it's, it's not particularly stand out, I don't think. I've heard that it's um, a pirate game that someone has annoying assassin stuff in the story that you have to get past. Honestly, it, like, it kind of is, which is not what I come to the series for. Hmm. And I think that's why it's historically ranked very low in my, like, personal hierarchy of Assassin's Creeds. It's like a, a good pirate game, but a bad assassin game. Yeah, that's kind of it. If it if they had dropped the pretense of it being an assassin game, um, like, if they had just made that game standalone and dropped all pretense pretense of it being assassin's creed nonsense and the animus nonsense which was also bad in that um like if they if they drop that i think they would have a much stronger game all out even like it's it's you interacting with famous pirates and stuff too like um blackbeard is definitely there like all oh, that's famous very pirates. assassin's creed isn't it it's very assassin's creed um Yard Gnome 737 asks, doesn't uh, Ubisoft have a pirate game coming out that's exactly that? Black Flag without the Assassin's Creed? No, is the answer to that. They have a game that is entirely the ship combat portion, and none of the, like, getting off at islands and getting treasure and doing contracts and, like, all of that stuff I feel like is cool, and Sea of Thieves has that kind of down pat in a really goofy way in a way that's very oriented towards your friends as well i've noticed the art style of sea of thieves and i I find it kind of surprising that they're going for that goofiness alongside this really really nice um water simulation stuff does it seem incongruous at all to you to have not at all no i it doesn't seem incongruous primarily because the ocean sim that is in sea of thieves for all it is like really really gorgeous and true to life I feel in a lot of bits and pieces. It is also like in keeping with its hyper saturated cartoonish kind of aesthetics. I feel like they work really harmoniously together because they've up the saturation and it's still Mm -hmm. just Mm -hmm. as colorful as the rest of the world. So like that, that is really, really a good approach, I think. And it's going to mean that sea of thieves is going to age really, really well. Hmm. That's a good point. Because, yeah, more stylized graphics, they don't seem to get old as quickly. Because if you're trying to be photorealistic, that's when you can quickly start to look old, right? But um, exactly, the, the ocean simulation looks like it's going to hold up. And you get diminishing returns by this point as well, right? I mean, you can yeah. still improve it, but the closer it gets to, I guess, some perfect ideal, the less room there is for improvement. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think I've talked about this before. I think we're at a point where I really don't see the value in game developers continuing the pursuit of photorealism. Like that's kind of where I think we've, we've reached. Yeah. You've, you've mentioned this a few times before. I wonder though, if, if there might be some benefit to it for VR stuff, I might be more inclined to talk, to argue that if I didn't still think VR is a gimmick that will get passed. I think people have reported in general that the VR experience is better with a more cartoony thing to immerse themselves in. Oh, because in spite of it in spite of it being cartoony and stuff, it's also less prone to motion sickness. Ah. Which is a big concern for VR platforms on the whole. Right. I hadn't considered that. Yeah. Um Zaf Apogee notes in the chat uh, that the other aspects of Sea of Thieves, gameplay-wise, would seem kind of weird with a more realistic art direction anyway. Yeah, like, there's bits like launching people out of cannons. Like, that's not going to gel with a, <laughs> okay, right, yeah. a a very realistic art style. And I think I saw that skeletons are all the enemies, like pirate skeletons specifically. Yeah, there is a lot of pirate skeletons. Um, I I think that... You know, having seen it, I don't think it is for me. Um, first and foremost, there isn't kind of very much to do uh, from what I've seen of Sea of Thieves. It seems very pretty. It seems like it's going to be a great game to spend a lot of hours in with your friends, but there seems to be limited contract kind of um, variety. 
and there seems to be, you know, just in general, not a lot to do. That might be changed over the course of time through either cheap DLCs or free patches. Um, that variety is probably going to go up over time. Hmm. But it doesn't seem like there's a lot for me right now, and it pits you against other players kind of by default. While well, you can right. sail around and all that with yourself or your friends, um, there are other players in the world, and they could just as easily decide to fuck up your ship if you come too close because they don't know what you're going to do or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't like that. Yeah, aspect same. of gameplay I don't think I feel like uh, for me personally if I want to scratch a pirate itch I'll probably go and pick up Black Flag yeah I've I've been thinking about picking up AC4 again just to see that like gorgeous ocean simulation again <laughs> yeah I really and, like, enjoyed the that around. part of the of Assassin's Creed 3 so more of that ha- has always appealed to me I've just never actually gone and picked up um, Black Flag I really think you would like it if you enjoyed that aspect of Assassin's Creed 3. You know, you get past 20 minutes of Animus nonsense and you're good to go for the rest <laughs> of the game. Yeah. I think you can survive that. Oh, yeah. I've survived worse, in- worse introductions than that. <laughs> um, Yardnome737 notes in the chat, the potential for harassment is real. Back in the tech test, I got harassed by a squad of four for a solid hour as they followed me from island to island. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a... Yeah, this that this, that sort of stuff is one reason why I don't like going to games that have the, the potential for that stuff. And it worries me or makes me a bit anxious when I'm playing games like Dark Souls. Like when I was playing, I mentioned I played some Bloodborne. Yeah. I specifically went and did, no, I'm going to play this offline because I, I don't want to have to worry about is some rando going to jump into my world and try to attack me. Yeah, exactly. I also don't want to be worried about that aspect of things, necessarily. Even even games like Elite, I'm on my toes for that, but in Elite specifically, I haven't run into that as much of a problem. Hmm. Um, uh, Yard Gnome also yeah. contributes a further note. There's little you can do to fight the um, fight people who are... Um, harassing your boat. They just respawn on their boats. They can beat you down by attrition if they want to. Right, so even if you if you get rid of them all, they're still there. Yeah, the death penalty is, like, really limited. There's no, like, currency penalties or anything like that. Right. Um, it's just kind of, well, you wait, you know, 10, 15 seconds, and you respawn again on your boat. Hmm. Um, on a yeah. More positive note on this kind of thing, I saw that the Monster Hunter patch, which I think has just come out this afternoon, um, they've fixed the griefing problem where people could knock people out of carving animations at the end of fights and stop them getting resources for carving the monsters. Oh, so okay. now um, players can't um, use small knockbacks to knock other players out of the carving animation. And after the mission ends, nothing can knock you out of a carving animation. That's my understanding, at least. Huh. That's a smart anti-harassment system. Yeah, it's just right. remove remove people's ability to harass. Yeah. Um, Pretty straightforward. Also, in that patch, the devil pickles back. Yeah, uh, I I haven't started the game up tonight. Like I said, I've got a busy week, so it'll probably be next week before I get it before I actually try that out. Um, but yeah, Devil Joe's in this patch, so. That'll be fun. Like I like I was saying, I hope it's challenge. Um, it is apparently, um, according to Capcom's notes on Twitter, um, the Devil Joe will begin to target you at rank six and seven quests and randomly join them to fuck you up. I mean, that's exactly what I expected it would do. Six and rank six and seven quests are the lowest rank, um, high rank quests. Right. Um, and that's what it normally does. Is it shows up in high ranks. And when you're not expecting it, it just comes in and tries to step on you and eat you and stuff. Um, uh, Ash it... ran into one on an expedition as well. Oh, cool. This afternoon. Uh, and it really gave her trouble by the looks of things. So okay. I think you're in for a treat with the Devil Joe. Although the other aspect you have to consider is Ash has never encountered Devil Joe before and I've killed dozens. So that it's is also, fair. It also depends on if it has exactly the same moveset as before, how much 
damage it does. I know that they've um, debuffed some of the... Um, actually, no. I don't think this has happened. One thing that's special about Devil Joe is it's one of the few monsters that can apply the defense down effect. And in Monster Hunter World, I think there's only one monster. And it's not even like a monster you hunt. It's one of the insects that flies around. No, sorry. It's one of the, the wing drakes that flies around that can inflict defense down, which is a really right. dangerous effect. So people might not be prepared for it. But in previous games, the Devil Joe's saliva when it's hungry, which is all the time. Um, <laughs> when it hits you with its mouth, you will get defense down, which significantly decreases your defense. You take more damage. But, yeah. I mean, if you're prepared for it, it's not that big a hassle. So, we'll see. We'll see. I'm hoping it's a challenge. Frankly, if it's not, I'll just use some worse gear and then it'll be harder. But um, I'm glad that it's there. I'm glad that they, they are adding new content to this game, including monsters. That's, that's cool. I hope that it won't just be Devil Joe and that's the end of it. I imagine that more is coming. Yeah, I imagine so um, as well. I just don't know if there's anything announced. <laughs> With regards to monsters that have appeared in previous games, um, you mentioned earlier that you were concerned about maybe Devil Joe having the same move set and that maybe making things too easy for you. Uh, do other monsters that have appeared in previous games have different move sets, or are they all the same in Monster Hunter World roughly? Um, so they're mostly the same, but they've been small revamps. Like when the Raytheon does its turn around and run, it's it um the way it moves its head before that is a bit different. When uh it when um flying ribbons like that, when they do their tail spin, their animation has changed. But the movesets okay. themselves are essentially the same. It's just some animations have been retooled. They fit better together um more naturally as well. Like it's not as obvious when it swaps between one attack and another. But right. but aside from those tweaks, the movesets have been the same from what I've seen. Okay. And do you, do you feel like Monster Hunter World's been particularly easy for you as a result? Or I mean, I, I think the fact that I've already sunk hundreds of hours into Monster Hunter before playing it, like, <laughs> it put me on the best footing to start with. Um, I mean, yeah, that's fair. I wasn't expecting a challenge through most of the game. It's the in-game stuff where I hope there'd be a lot of that. What previous Monster Hunter games have often done is, um, in the end game, there are a lot of like random end boss monsters from this and previous games that you fight in like arena battles, and they're often quite difficult. Sometimes there are specific quests where you fight like two of a fast and powerful monster in an enclosed space, which are quite difficult. It's that sort of thing that they haven't had as much of here. Um, They've got the end boss, which is an arena fight, but it's not a fast monster. It's quite big and slow, and though it's a long fight, I wouldn't call it a particularly difficult fight. Um, they've got a couple of new Elder Dragons, which are the top tier normal enemies, but and and then they've got the powered up versions of those as well. But they all share the same skeleton, and and so they'll share some of their moves together. They've all got sort of their different themes, like you know, there's um. The Teostra is one of the old ones, which which does a lot of fire and explosive attacks. And there's one that's got a lot of wind attacks. And there's, um, I feel like, I, I know what one other is, and I feel like I'm missing another one. Anyway, there's a bunch. Um, but there's missing some monsters, like the Rajang from previous games was a common in-game monster that was really fast. It would move around a lot, and it's quite powerful. Um... Mm -hmm. Devil Joe will make a good addition. I think it'll round things out pretty nicely. Um, especially since a lot of the time when you're not explicitly hunting it, it will be showing up out of the blue to mess you up. Kind of like the Basil Goose has been doing um, as a new monster in Monster Hunter World. It's the one that starts appearing in high rank and shows up all the time. It messes you up and makes everything explode, which is really good. But when you're fighting it on its own, it's not always that super difficult, at least I find. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm hoping Devil Joe's a challenge. It will definitely be a challenge for a lot of people, especially if you've not encountered one before. I'm hoping that I have fun. I'm sure I'll have fun with it. I'm, I'm sure definitely looking to. forward to getting to it. Come on. Yeah. What I, what I hope they might they might do or have done, um, in previous games there's been a, like a Berserk Devil Joe variant you can hunt, which is basically one that is in its rage mode all the time to make it more difficult. So often there's like a higher tier quest to hunt one of those. Gotcha. Sweet. Yeah, I, I, 
Monster Hunter World, I still need to put some time into, and I don't know when that's going to happen yet. W whenever it does but... happen, let me know, because I'll be real keen to put on some low rank gear and help you out. <laughs> that sounds like a plan to me. Yeah. What to talk about next? Well, I, I kind of want to um, ask you something. Uh, to guess yeah, something, because like I mentioned, I, I've played more Diablo 3, and you remember when we were last playing it together, what sort of damage were we doing? Can you remind me? Uh, you were doing probably around 30 million per hit, I believe, was where you were at. I've played a bunch more, and though I still haven't gotten all the items I want for the build I'm going for, I've gotten a fair amount more powerful. Would you like to guess what sort of damage I do now? gonna be guessing at on an average you know standard attack not using any of your skills or anything oh uh, my skills are all necessary to deal the damage <sighs> fine dealing with your skills and everything um 600 to 800 million per hit that's on the that's on the low end maybe when i'm not using all the skills the highest single damage thing I've seen was 50 billion. Woo! <laughs> this game is ridiculous. <laughs> the way it scales its damage. Watch those numbers go up! Right? When you find a couple of legendary items that are like, Hey, these both increase the skill by eight times. And they stack quite nicely together. Um, so, yeah, things really melt now. Like, fighting the Rift bo Guardian bosses... They'll take two hits, and my attack speed is really high. So Jesus that's fun. Christ. <laughs> I should probably increase the difficulty a bunch, um, frankly. I think I'm on Torment 9 out of 13. Um, and things are yeah, melting. Yeah, you could probably just go straight to 13 at or this point. The difficulties go up really steeply. I'm pretty sure it might even be exponential. Um, if I went to 13, mm. I'd probably find I'm, like... 50 billion might be the health of a small enemy. I don't know. These things go up real fast. My main problem isn't my damage output now. It's if anything has like a ranged attack that can hit me, or if I don't kill stuff fast enough to stop it dealing melee damage to me, I'll probably die real fast. The main way I survive is by killing things before they can hit me. Right. It's so sort of a glass cannon kind of approach you've got oh, going on very, at this point. Very, very. Um... Because there's a lot of things that... Uh, it's much easier right now to boost my damage. There are a couple of items, specific legendary items that I want to get because I can see how they'd fit really well with my current build. Um, and I've been trying to get them by like specifically upgrading the right type of item and buying stuff with blood shards, but I just I haven't found... There's, there's a particular fist weapon and there's a particular ring, um, both of which will increase my damage output, not my defense. But they'll increase it by one will one will double it, and one will um, basically eliminate cooldowns on the skills that increase my damage by like eight times. So it'll um, once I get those, I'll my damage output again will increase significantly, assuming I get them before the season ends. At what point do you feel like um, the damage numbers just kind of stop mattering? Like it it goes up and up and up, but like. What do you get from the numbers going up? I get to see numbers go up. What do you mean? That's the end goal. <laughs> I suppose there is a certain satisfaction to that, but like... Yeah. Um, Diablo scaling works in such a way that the numbers go up, but like enemy health pools just keep increasing alongside that. Well, so, so like at, at what point does... So the, the health pools will increase as you d increase the difficulty. If I stay at Torment 9 and my damage goes up, I'll just kill the enemies faster. Um, so mm -hmm. I can kind of scale it to where I feel like it's fun for me. And it's a, it's a good podcast game, um, which makes me kind of sad now that I've finished the main Adventure Zone arc because I was doing that a lot while playing Diablo. Um, mm. I need to find a new one now. Um... But yeah, or just listen to the experimental arcs because they're all pretty great. Yeah, no, that's what I've been thinking of doing. Um, but again, with uh, I've got so much stuff to do in the evenings this week that I'll have to wait a little bit. Yeah, I would recommend um, if you wanted a, 
a starting point on the experimental arcs, mm -hmm. start with Amnesty. Okay. I feel like Amnesty is probably my favorite of the experimental arcs so far. Cool. Yeah. A little bit um, supernatural mystery. Griffin is DMing that one. Um, should be good, I reckon. Be like, um, like monsters and weird happenings. Hmm. I, 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 spooky. I'm I'm looking forward actually to trying out the new stuff because I like the feel of the whole thing, and I think that they they grew quite a lot while they're doing it, and I'm interested to see what they start now that they've gotten to the point they were at at the end. If that makes sense. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, experimenting with new people and systems or sorry, new people in new roles and new systems to fiddle around with. Like hmm. I think that aspect of the adventure zone has become the most interesting to me. Okay. Is that that particular aspect of experimentation, seeing what they do with these roles and systems. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. So um, well there so. you go. <laughs> you go. I was going to ask what you're looking forward to playing this week, but if you've got something else first. I don't have something else first. Okay. What are you looking forward to playing this week? I am looking forward to playing Overwatch. Of course. Uh, like I said, I've, I've got um, got a team that I'm potentially playing with soon. It should be interesting. Uh, Yakuza 0 is about to get really interesting, I think. Sorry, you good... dropped out for a couple of words there. It's about to get what, sorry? Yakuza 0 is about to get really, really interesting, I think. Cool. I've reached a point where both protagonists are potentially going to be running into each other. So that ah. should be very, very interesting to see. Yeah. Um, plot lines are colliding. And I'm getting closer and closer to the end. Bittersweet I'm really excited about that. End. Yeah, I, I'm excited to see where this goes, though, because it's been such a fantastic story thus far. Nice. And it's got some perspective switches going on, too, which is a thing that I've talked about yeah. wanting more of in games, and Yakuza 0 has a really good execution on that. Um, so those, I think, are the two things I'm most excited about playing. Nice. Um... I'm really excited about a game that's coming out, though. What's that? Um, Nino Kuni 2 is out pretty soon, I think, like this week or so. Is that is the first one of that the one that you said looks like a Studio Ghibli film? Yes, because it was partially animated by Studio Ghibli. And that would make sense then. Yep. Cool. So what's um, that coming out on? It's on all major consoles and PC. Oh, cool. Um, it's another game in that similar kind of art style to um, Ghibli. Ghibli's not involved in this project, but they were involved in the original. Mm -hmm. um, it looks gorgeous. It's gotten reviewed quite well. So I'm cool. I'm kind of excited about that. I might be looking into seeing what I can do about picking that up at nice. some point soon. When does it come out? I think maybe next next week, I believe. Okay. On Tuesday. Cool. Yeah. How about you? What are you looking forward to playing this week? Oh, I... I don't know. I've had two um, chunks of data released to me this week that I'm going through in my evening, so I don't know if I'm going to get much gaming. Um, if I do, I'll probably be trying um, Shadow Tactics again. I want to see if I can... Um, Get out of the bit I got myself stuck in and progress through. I want to see the last character I haven't met yet and see where the story goes. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I mean, depending on what sort of game I'm feeling like, if I just want to relax for an hour, then I'll probably just play some more Diablo and see if I get the right item drop to to improve my build. But um, gotcha, aside yeah. from those two, I don't have anything in particular I think I'm going to be... Oh! What the hell am I talking about? I'll probably try Hunting a Devil Joe. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, duh, of course. Go hunt yourself a devil, Joe. Yeah, it's, I'm sure I'll, I'll do, find some time to do that over the next week. Sweet. Um, all right. I think that is going to do it for the 77th episode of Pausecast. 
Thank you so much for tuning in live if you did so. Uh, and even if you didn't, thank you for tuning in. Um, if you'd like to support the show, we have a few ways to do that. First, you can rate or review the show on iTunes, Google Play, or your uh, platform of choice. Another way you can support us is by donating to our coffee. Go to uh, bit.ly slash podcast coffee. Uh, that is no spaces, no nothing like that. And uh, you can donate a one-time donation through that page. Um, if you'd like to support us monthly, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash podcast show and contribute as little as a dollar a month and get access to a Discord role, which indicates that you have, um, you're supporting the show, as well as um, early access to content when we release it, and a thank you every week on the show. Thank you so much to all of our patrons. Dove, Cory Bat, Ash Yee, Laminated Moth, PD, Tara, Allodrain, Residoke, Mary, and Sammy for the continued support of the show. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's see. What else we got going on? Uh, if you want to follow the show on Twitter, you can do so at Podcast Show. Mark, where can people find you online? I'm on Twitter at HonestUniverse, and I write a blog as well, though not about video games, at HonestUniverse.com. Do you want to tell people what data you're looking at? Sure. So um, on Monday, I got some data on police pursuits in New Zealand and the pursuit policies. And just today, I got some information from the State Services Commission about efficient information at response times. Um, so both of those are pretty different and pretty interesting. I'm seeing what I can find out about them and we'll probably end up writing about the pursuit stuff, and then I'm going to be asking a bunch of other agencies for similar OAA response time data, and then we'll be working on that further down the line. This was kind of a test case with that one. I wonder if you'd be able to get that information from the police. Yeah, that's going to be a hard one, because they they receive a lot more of these requests than any other agency, so if I'm asking for, say, six months' worth of data, it's a lot of work for them, so I might have trouble getting that. Uh, we'll see, because I do okay. want to include them in this project. Maybe you can include them as smaller requests? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm going to have to have a think about how best to handle that, because they get way more requests than pretty much any other agency. Um, like the SSC sent me 96 requests over a year. I think police okay. get something like 10,000 over a year. Um, so it's, it's, it's very different scales. Um, so yeah, no, I, I definitely want to include them. I'm going to have to think hard about how best to do that. Oh, sweet. Uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, you can find me at TealQT. Uh, you can also find me at, by going to bird.school or maximumgun.org. Uh, either of those links will take you where you need to go. Uh, and that's almost it. Thank you to Leon for the use of our theme song, Honey Milk Island. You can find Leon's music and download some of it for free at soundcloud.com slash L-E-Y-A-W-N. Excuse me. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of PauseCast. And until next week, see you around and bird up. Bye.